waters were coming. Everyone knew they eventually would, and those who could fled. The biblical flood rushed through the streets, pushing boats down the streets and sinking cars and houses and animals and people. Towers that once dominated the land now stood lonely in the middle of a newly created sea. The sight of water where it should not be, covering everything, was unnatural. By the time the flood subsided, the city as we knew it was gone. This is, of course, not New Orleans. It is New York in the 1912 novel Second Deluge, or the 1933 film Deluge, uh, or in When Worlds Collide, a 1951 film that is soon to be remade by Steven Spielberg next year. And it will come out just after I Am Legend has been in the movie theaters for right now, um, featuring a city laid waste by a mutant virus, and Cloverfield, which is coming up in, I think, at the end of next week, featuring an attack on New York by the latest creature to terrorize the city. And it will follow dozen, a dozen other fantasies of the waters of the bay rising and overtaking the island metropolis over the past two centuries. Uh, as you can see, I've spent the better part of several years immersed in the fictional imaginings of New York's destruction, doing very good business for Netflix, and probably awakening the ever watchful and intrusive eyes of the FBI. <laughs> Welcome, officers. Uh, <laughs> Scholars have done tremendous work in past generations to examine the centrality of disasters in both revealing social fissures within society and shifting the trajectory of economic and political life. Several of those scholars are here today. But I'd like to briefly suggest the importance of another part of the story, the long tradition of imagined disasters. I'd like to suggest that imagined disasters themselves are both reflections of social struggles and tools of social and political struggle in their own right. I'd like to um, to the very end, to suggest the role of these fictional disasters in a city's progress. America's writers and image makers have pictured New York's an annihilation in a stunning range of ways. Earthquake, fire, flood, meteor, comet, Martian, glacier, ghost, atom bomb, class warfare, terrorism, invasion, laser beams from spaceships, torpedoes from zeppelins, missiles from battleships, apes, wolves, dinosaurs, environmental degradation, nuclear fallout, green death, it goes on and on and on. American culture has really been obsessed with fantasizing about the destruction of New York. And at each stage of New York's advance over the past two centuries, I argue, visions of how the city would be demolished, blown up, swallowed by the sea, or toppled by monsters have proliferated in painting, graphic arts, cartoons, literature, photography, postcards, and now computer software. These visions have not been the purview of simply of elite artists and novelists, but a common narrative inscribed in all popular forms of communication and, and culture. Visions of New York's destruction have resonated with some of the most long-standing themes in American history. The ambivalence toward cities, the troubled reaction to immigrants and racial diversity, the fear of technology's impact and the apocalyptic strain in American religious life. Furthermore, they, these visions of, of the city's end have paralleled the city's economic, political, racial, and physical transformations. Um, projections of the city's end reflected and refracted the dominant social issues of, of, of the time. Artists and writers of, er of every era, each with their own world of, of cultural and social concerns, return to New York to destroy it, both to entertain their audiences and to define their stances on the social concerns of the day. It's a storyline that plays through, as I say, every type of fiction American culture has produced. As, but as varied as the, the, as the media are, the vehicles are, the, the narratives plan two consistent, if harmonically different keys. One is the dark, minor key of alarm and warning, lessons and political arguments, fear and premonition of real disaster. And the other is the key of celebration and entertainment, homage and love for the city. These two registers mark the two ends of the American ideological composition. On one hand, the persistent embrace of progress and modernism, utopia and ascent. And on the other hand, the suspicion of failure and the harsh call of the Jeremiah American identity has been built, as Kevin Rosario will elegantly, eloquently um, tell us in a minute, on a culture of calamity. And I would add to that that a, this culture has been in part built on the imagining of, of New York's end. It's the former that, the, or the, the rather the, the former, yes, the unexpected hopefulness and optimism that is belied by the horrors on screen or on canvas that I was surprised by as I tried to make sense of the thousands, literally thousands, of New York disaster fantasies that have coursed through my, <laughs> through my brain over the past several years. If you were worried about New York after 9-11, as most of us were, you could, also, you could take heart in 2005 
because just like old times, the city was being destroyed at a theater probably near you. The best thing for New York at that moment might have been King Kong, returning, tramping through the streets of Manhattan on his way to the fateful appointment on the top of the Empire State Building. For if there was one thing that came to symbolize New York's preeminence and resilience, is that so many still wanted to imagine the city's end. I came to realize only slowly that instead of bemoaning the degradation of our insensitive culture, that is all these, the, the violence and the disaster scenarios we seem to, what I've come to call disaster porn, that perhaps actually we should celebrate these fantasies. New York has been destroyed for so long that it is, it is somehow reassuring. So what exactly does this have to do with New Orleans? We were asked to wonder what will historians be writing about Katrina and the destruction of New Orleans in 50 years? When I hear such a question, um, which cannot but be a cover for asking a historian to predict the future, I break out in hives <laughs> and await the scolding looks of graduate school advisors who said you do not predict the future. But let me be brave, or uh, is it somewhat brave. <laughs> um, perhaps there will come a time when we, we will be able to see the horrible beauty of Katrina, but not now. We can do this for New York, and did so relatively soon after 9-11, because we were able to see out of that tragedy, which in some ways was more limited in a purely physical um, manner, um, to see that the living city as a memorial to those who died. Millions of lives went on working and selling and creating and playing in the most diverse city on earth. But in New Orleans, as we've already been hearing, we've not reached that point. We are devastated by documentaries such as Spike Lee's When the Levees Broke. We are treated to endless photographs of the city which in many cases do not look dramatically different than soon after the event several years ago. Here is a city that was abandoned by its government and moves forward fitfully, largely on its own. We can't spin fantasies of New York's end because the end seems so close to the recent past and future. In New Orleans, we see largely ongoing stories of the real disaster. So perhaps 50 years from now, we will all return to laugh and analyze. Yes, laugh even at the latest terrifying or campy or, or even uplifting New York disaster, uh, New Orleans disaster movies and novels. And that, I would suggest, would be a happy day.